Greetings. Hello. Welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight, or at least every time we're here together, we fight the good fight. Glad to see. I see a bunch of folks in the chat room. And in fact, I was following some of the remarks before uh, we started and just want to know, I just want to let you know, it's nice to have you here and uh, glad we can share this time here together. So let me jump right in. Uh, Got a few things to discuss, not just one theme. I know I had a really fun title here, Human Extinction and UFOs. Um, can often be the life of the parties. You, you know, you get to know me well enough, and you know, I'm, I'm good for that sort of thing. But uh, actually, that will be an interesting thing to discuss. Before we get into that, uh, just a couple of other things. So, like, my goodness, there is just so much happening in this UFO field of ours, is there not? I just learned that uh, tomorrow, I think Chris Mellon will be on the Joe Rogan show. That should be quite interesting. I think uh, we'll want to hear what comes out of that. And I think without a doubt, the New Yorker article a little earlier in the week featuring Leslie Kane was very interesting, especially for a mainstream publication. I mean, for those of us who've been in this subject matter for a long time, and there wasn't really anything that was monumental, though it were a couple of little things that were interesting. But by and large, it was, I would say, a good overview of the UFO subject in general. But, you know, you keep in mind, even, even something like that for the general public, that's pretty strong medicine. It's pretty strong medicine. Uh, we often forget, those of us who are deep in the weeds of this subject year after year, you know, we take everything with this uh, subject for granted, but uh, most of the world still doesn't. Even after these last few years of getting a little bit more love from the mainstream media, New York Times, Fox, you know, even some CNN. Yeah, so it's out there, but not. it's not really like it hasn't made its way mm, into the depths of the souls of most people, you know, uh, wandering around planet Earth. I remember many, many times, especially in my early years of, uh, you know, being engaged in the UFO subject uh, when my kids were little, particularly as I'd take them out to like library or the local park or what have you. And there's always other parents there and, you know, parents get to chat. They're like, what do you do? What do you do? And I'm like, oh, well, I write about UFOs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, every time I would do that, every now and then there'd be someone who'd be interested in that, but more than once, more than once, uh, if I started talking about the subject for like one or two minutes, I could literally see the fear in the eyes of the person I'm talking to. More than once. These are nice people, you know, nice suburban soccer moms, soccer dads, whatever. And it's it's evident that this is a subject. I think anyone who has gone into it long enough understands. Like if you, <clears throat> if you are if you go deep enough into this, it can it can bring up some existential issues. And I think most people instinctively understand this. And so it's one thing if the UFO subject is on a very uh, kind of fun, superficial level, make a fun movie out of it, that type of thing, they're great with that. But when you actually get into the genuine issues, the, the serious issues that make this subject so fascinating, that's actually a, a very different thing. And for many people, yes, an article like what appeared in the New Yorker is strong medicine. Again, it's easy to forget that. So uh, I think it was interesting that it appeared for me, and I think for a lot of folks, the big drop in that article, the big piece of information was that reference to Lockheed. You know, and it was toward the end when they bring up Harry Reid uh, and his failed attempt to get any information out of Lockheed. Now, I, I only have one uh, visual I'm going to share with you, and this is it. This is the quote from, uh, from that article. I'm just going to read. This is Harry Reid saying, I was told for decades that Lockheed had some of these retrieved materials, and I tried to get, as I recall, a classified approval by the Pentagon to have me go look at the stuff. They would not approve that. I don't know what all the numbers were, what kind of classification it was, but they would not give that to me. 
So that's Harry Reid. Oh, let's uh, get that out of there. So um, interesting, right? And this is not the first time an interesting little statement about Lockheed has come up in the UFO field. As a matter of fact, look, Lockheed, of all the corporate players that are, are known to have something to do with UFOs, I think you've got to say Lockheed probably gets front row center here in terms of the amount of attention we should be giving it. Reason? It's not necessarily the case that Lockheed has done more work on this than any other company. We, we don't know. We don't know. But we do know that a lot of data points relating to Lockheed have come out over the years. I mean, from the Kelly Johnson years, uh, he had his own engagement. Kelly Johnson was a consultant on a UFO paper that landed on the desk of, of Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s. We should talk about that sometime. I, I'll actually be mentioning that in my uh, lecture in a couple of weeks, my online thing. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, and then we're going to get into human extinction. Uh, but <laughs> relating to Lockheed, um, yeah, there's so many data points. Then you've got the Ben Rich quotes, and then you've got the flux line or the ARV and the information that came out through Mark McCandless, who, by the way, recently passed away. Rest in peace, Mark. Mark McCandless, I just want to say, uh, was a a truly like an important and good human being. He was a good man, and he, you know, aside from being maybe the best or one of the very best aviation illustrators in the world. All right, he is the man who gave us the illustration of the ARV, and you can Google that it's all over the web. Um, based on a conversation he had with a colleague of his named Brad Sorensen who had gone to a very special air show at a Lockheed hangar back in 1988. And uh, that's a really important story. I think it's a true story. And that's just one of many, many critically important connections that Lockheed has. There are connections, I believe, that Dr. Eric Davis has had to Lockheed. They're not proven, but I, I believe that that is the case. I'll be talking about that in a few weeks as well. So Lockheed is important, and the fact that it was in, included in this New Yorker piece. You know, we're at a point in this subject, in this field, where there's a lot of, a lot of talk is going on below the surface. And uh, some of it, not all of it, some of it comes to me. Sometimes people will throw little tidbits out at me and they'll be like, I heard this, I heard this, I heard this. Well, what can you tell me? Well, I can't tell you everything. I can't tell you much. I'm like, thanks for, thanks for nothing. But <laughs> the fact is that there are, uh, I do hear things sometimes and there are uh, rumors, people talking about the UAP task force, some big thing may drop relating to that. Well, maybe, or something else that I don't even know about, but there's this expectation, I really believe, that some people are having about this particular era that we're living in. You hear hints about it over and over again. I can just say that I personally do not, I do not know of any specific, uh, like anything that I would say is definite. And I don't even know of anything that I would say is even likely. I, other people may know. I don't. Uh, it would be nice to know. Maybe someone will, will let me in on it. But right now, I, I would say that there's definitely a an expectation that something can happen. My own take on this is, like, normally I would say, no, I don't think something's going to happen. If this were any, like, last year, two years ago, five years ago, I would say definitely not. Uh, I'm still inclined to say I don't think we're going to really see a major breakthrough. I don't think we're going to see like disclosure. Certainly not expecting that. Certainly not expecting a full and honest and complete disclosure. Absolutely not. Uh, but I'm not even really expecting a disclosure that gets us over what I keep calling the red line. The red line basically being an acknowledgement of crash retrievals of UFOs. And that to me is really the key part. Like, and we are, we are right at that line. Like for all intents and purposes, we are pretty darn close to that line. You know, there have been a number of semi-official statements that have taken us right to that edge, but we're not there. And I just don't think we're going to go over it. I think that that's going to be, that's a bridge too far. That's too much. And if you, if you ever see an official acknowledgement of UFO crash retrievals, I mean, to me, we're in an era in which 
you're not supposed to believe in conspiracy theories ever again for the rest of all time, like ever. You know, that's a phrase that's been so blown out of any common sense anymore. Like everyone uses it and they use it all in the wrong circumstances. Like something's a conspiracy theory if it's simply a true fact, like sometimes, like, come on, use the phrase in the right way. But the, the fact is we're not supposed to entertain conspiracy theories. You got YouTube banning them. You got Google, uh, Facebook, and everyone else. Like if it's the wrong conspiracy theory, God forbid, uh, you you become unpersoned. Like, you know, like in the old Soviet Union, you just like don't exist anymore. They'll airbrush you out of the, out of the algorithm. But the fact is, the UFO cover-up is the mother of all conspiracy theories. Let's get real here. Like it is. And if there is ever a genuine acknowledgement of UFO crash retrievals, are you kidding me? That is, that's the grand conspiracy theory of all. It's like the government saying, don't believe in conspiracy theories, but yeah, the UFO part, well, that was true. So I, I just, I, you know, I just don't think we're going to see that and not voluntarily, not voluntarily. Now, you know, what a lot of people I think ought to remember is that there are a lot of factors in the ball game these days that are pushing things forward. And I've been predicting this for 20 years. And what I've been saying is that we're in an era in which uh, social and technological change for the people, that's for you and me, is now at the, ca the, the, the stage where we're able to communicate with each other like very easily. We're able to share information very easily. We're able to, we're able to push on our own. And we have been pushing on our own, believe it or not, for 20 years. <clears throat> Don't underestimate the power of what we have been doing with the web all this time. We have been effecting change. And sometimes, you know, years would go by and you feel like, well, I'm not really doing a whole lot, but we're doing a lot and we've been doing a lot. And so there is a push and it, it's harder and harder for that establishment to ignore what has been coming from below. Now they're going to deal with it and they're going to they're going to spin it and they're going to lie about it and they're going to do all the things that they can do to maintain control and to maintain the deep and true secret on this subject for as long as possible. And if they can do it for another 5 years they'll do it. If they can do it for 50 years they'll do that. If they can do it for another century or more that will happen. They'll do it if they can. I don't think it's going to last for a century. And I don't think it's going to last for 50 years. I don't know how long it will last, but it's, you know, it's not going to last forever. All right. So anyway, so I got a little off. That was a New Yorker article and I got off into Lockheed and the cover up and all of that. And I'm going to be talking more about this. So let me just mention my, um, my uh, online event that I'm doing on May 20th. I, I haven't really talked much about this lately. You know, we're at a point in our, our world where we've got this formal admission from the military that UFOs are real. Okay, so that's obviously very important. But what it really means, I keep thinking, is that this is now where the real conversation can begin. Because it's not just a matter of, you know, whether are there aliens here or not. Yes, obviously, that is important. And, you know, we want to keep talking about that. But something else is very important is to what extent have we been able to make those objects? To what extent have we been able to replicate acquired exotic ET tech, alien technology? Because every piece of evidence points to that conclusion. Our military strongly appears to have recovered exotic technology. And it strongly appears that for more than 70 years, it's been trying to figure it out and to replicate it. All right. So we want to ask something that I, you know, we don't really ask enough which are what are the corporations that are most involved in the research of this and the research and development and the fabrication, manufacturing? What are the scientific principles that are behind all of this? What are the technologies? What is the evidence that we have to even make this case that this is even happening? And where are we gonna be in another 10 years, 20 years, 50 years of all of this subject? We're gonna have some kind of disclosure. We're gonna have fake disclosure. Are we gonna have the dam bursting and everything coming out. And what will happen, you know, what are the ramifications for human civilization once when these technologies become widely known and understood? 
So this is the kind of thing that I want to be talking about in less than three weeks. This is my event, UFO Secrecy in a Changing World. We've got a link below. Yes, this is my little ad for the event, but look, just let me do this here. So we've got Lou Elizondo who's joining me. I'm very glad I've got Lou Elizondo joining. A couple of people have said to me, why do you have a CIA disinformation agent here? I'm like, look, let's just talk to this man. All right, Lou Elizondo has a lot to say, and I can tell you I will be asking him questions, deep, meaningful questions, when he is part of this and he's agreed to it, he's totally on board and I am looking forward to having a very significant, meaningful back and forth with him. So there's that. And I think it's gonna be really worthwhile. Um, he's also gonna be answering questions from the attendees. So like if you attend, you can ask him. You can ask him the hardest question you wanna ask him. He's, he's there and I'll make him answer it. If he doesn't, I'll call him on it. And then we have four other really great researchers, the Young Guns, love those guys. That's uh, you know, Jay of Project Unity, uh, Danny Silva, Joe Mergia, and James Andoli of uh, Engaging the Phenomenon on YouTube channel. They're all awesome, and they are going to be there. They're, they're at the leading edge of a lot of the journalism that's going on in this field. So that's what we're doing, and we're going to have a really cool virtual reality environment. Uh, we, I was talking with some of our team about doing this show in the VR environment, and I was the one who said, look, I want to do that. I'm talking about the possibility of human extinction. It just seems a little weird to have my avatar up there as well when I'm doing this and in this VR environment. I thought, let's do that some other time. But the fact is, the environment is amazing. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, events where I, like, I'm just there meeting with people. Uh, I'm doing this again, by the way, Friday, uh, 9 o'clock Eastern. I'm just going to be in the observation deck. We've got a link for that below. If you have signed up for this event, you can go hang out. Like you don't have to wait for the event. The thing's available. There's people hanging out there all the time, actually. It's insane. I will be there again on Friday, nine o'clock Eastern. And anyone who's there can just hang out and talk to my avatar, but actually talk like on your microphone. We hear each other. It's, it works great. So anyway, that's just something to keep in mind. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So that's May 20th. Okay. Now, let me shift gears a little bit and uh, talk about the main theme that I that actually triggered this whole uh, program for tonight. I actually had this idea a few days ago, and I've just been mulling it over. So <clears throat> I don't need, I don't really have formal notes here. I've got informal notes, and I'm I'm honestly just I just want to riff here with you. So let's see how this comes out. Um, we take it for granted. All right, that we human beings, you know, that we're the dominant species on planet Earth. And, you know, we are. Let's forget about the aliens for a second. Let's just look at us and all the other creatures and plants and everything else. So there's us. So think about this. We are the only species on this planet, right, that actively subjugates all other species. We have domesticated all kinds of animals. Um, they never did that to each other, but we figured out a way. We domesticated a whole array of plants. Uh, you know, to the extent that their genetic structure is not what it was thousands of years ago. Same with the animals. Like a, a domesticated sheep doesn't look anything like a sheep in the wild. You know, if you look up those differences, it's dramatic. Modern day sheep have 30% uh, less brain capacity than sheep in the wild. That's through thousands of years of human domestication of those creatures and a lot of other things. They just are, they're totally different. Totally. They're much more docile. You know, we modified them through thousands of years of selective breeding because this is the kind of sheep we wanted. And that's what we've got. So we do this. No other species does that. And the thing is, you know, prior to uh, say 15,000 years ago, let's say, roughly speaking, we didn't really do it either. That really wasn't part of our thing. You know, you go back prior to uh, the agricultural revolution and you ask yourself, how much more dominant were human beings over all other species? And the answer basically is a little bit, but not a whole lot. 
uh, yeah, we'd mastered the use of fire for many, many, many thousands of years before that. And we had some really cool tools and weapons that we were able to hunt with, had all of that. We were doing really great artwork by then. We were doing music by then. So we really had a lot going for us, absolutely. Uh, we were doing what certainly appear to be religious ceremonies and ceremonial magic. That's pretty interesting. We were building pretty cool houses even by then. Like human beings 15,000 years ago were doing all right. But we were also very much, very much part of the natural world. Like there was no question about that. Um, but then things started to change, right? We went through the agricultural revolution. We started domesticating animals and plants and we started creating cities and societies and empires. And even through all of most of that period, right? Roman Empire, Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and any other, any part of the world. Uh, humans were developing a pretty significant impact, yeah, but not, not to the extent that it was really kind of creating all this uh, an ecological disorder, right? That only started about a couple of hundred years ago, really, when you get to the Industrial Revolution, say about 200 years ago, a little more than that, time of Napoleon, essentially. All right, it's when it really started in earnest. And then the last hundred years, definitely high gear, when we've now scurried around the world like a bunch of little termites terraforming everything around us and transforming the entire relationships of creatures and, and plant life to each other, because that's just what we do. We're real, we've become very good at that. You know, we've discovered, it's, I call it the, the fire of Prometheus science. We discovered that, we've got it, and we're using it. And it's almost like we can't really help ourselves, my opinion, and this is just what we do. But here's the thing. All life on this, and by the way, I'm coming back to aliens and UFOs, so just hang with me here. All life on this planet evolved to be interdependent, right? Yes, right. But human beings now dominate all other forms of life. I mean, we can we control the natural world to a very great extent, not 100%, obviously, but a very large degree. Now, here's the question. This is what I asked myself, and this is what I'm asking you. Can the global ecosystem actually survive the reality of a single apex predator dominant species that completely transforms the relationships that have existed since, you know, time immemorial, All right? You follow me? So when I think about this logically, so, you know, you have a system that's developed for millions of years in very intricate kind of a balance, the web of life, and here we come, boom, just throwing our weight around, changing things changing those relationships. So when I think about that as logically as I can, look, I'm not an expert in this. I'm not an environmental science expert, right? So when I think about it from my non-professional perspective, I still have to think the answer is no, that the system really can't, cannot handle that impact indefinitely. I mean, after all, we've only been, you know, like this for what, a century or two, essentially, right? Not a very long time period. So if you think, well, yeah, we've been industrialized for a long time and we're still here, the world's still here. I would just say, well, maybe you want to wait a little longer because not much time has actually passed. Now, I'm not saying that human beings are definitely going to go extinct, but you have to, you know, for me, that is a possibility that would be on the table. It has to be on the table. We're the apex predator. We rely on everything below us to function fully and in a healthy way and does that work so that everyone can get fed all the way up the chain and then there's us. So, I mean, does this necessarily mean that eventually if we just have our civilization as we do, that we're gonna see extinction of our species? No, I don't think that's necessarily the case. And I'll just say about uh, 10 minutes before I went on here, I was chatting with my son who actually knows environmental science in a way far, far greater than I ever will. And he thought, you know, where <clears throat> his opinion, he's a smart guy and I listened to him, is that probably not extinction, but definitely, definite possibility of serious problems coming our way. Like 
loss of many uh, species, loss of many millions of billions of human lives, totally possible, uh, with the possibility of a much lower uh, standard of living in the future for many people and all that. So that's his vision, not extinction. I think, okay, maybe. So anyway, now let's enter the aliens. Let's bring this in. So when I was, um, I wrote my book, The Alien Agendas, um, it's about six months ago now. And in that book, I entertain a theory that I was developing, which I basically call the fourth stage of humanity. So I've talked about this a lot. I'm not going to rehash the whole thing here, but just very briefly, very briefly, for those of it, for those of you who don't know it, essentially I posit that human beings for all of our history have gone through three stages of fundamental social organization with all kinds of variations. Yes, of course, but three fundamental forms hunting and gathering for most of our existence, sedentary agriculture for most of the last 10 plus thousand years, and then the last couple of hundred years, science and industry. That's stage three. That's the stage we were all born into. And I, I do think they are fundamentally distinct from each other. Yes, there's variations. Yes, there's a bit of a crossover, but I think you can see what I'm talking about. And I think we're now moving into a stage four. I call it transhumanist stage. I can call it the digital stage, the computer stage. There's lots of um, ways you can look at it. You can call it 24 seven surveillance digital totalitarian stage, because that's happening. You can tell it, you can call it humanity is one big giant anthill stage, because that's happening. All of those parts are happening. That's I think what we're moving into. And, and my thought has been and, and remains that because we are transforming ourselves as a, as a society, as a civilization, as a species, in such a way that we're, I mean, you could really say that we're turning ourselves into the very aliens that appear to be here. Hive mind, powerful social organization, but very, uh, not very powerful in terms of individual sovereignty, right? Like we're moving into all of that. Uh, no privacy. I, I think that's definitely where we're moving. And that's where I think it seems to me that is from what we gather through various testimony of interactions with these other beings, that appears to be at least for many of them, that seems to be the case. So we're, we're becoming like them. That's the fourth stage. And I, and I believe, you know, along with advanced AI that's coming, uh, very powerful weaponry, very powerful means of communication and information sharing. I mean, you can already see that in our world and it's only gonna become more and more. I mean, my God, we're at a point now where we, we're able to land a man-made object on the planet Mars and, and record it and send it live, the data live back to earth in basically real time. You think about how unbelievable that is. You know, you go out at night and you look at Mars up in the sky as this little point of light. We've developed the ability to get things over there and to do all kinds of other things. So we're at an, an, an incredible phase of what our species is capable of doing. So anyway, I've, I've theorized that because of this, this has triggered a heightened interest by them in us. And it's not like they haven't been watching us all along because I think they have been watching us all along but I believe at a much more distant, lower level observation. I mean, what else could they really do in, with a group of societies that revolve around a medieval castle and serfs plowing, you know, working in the field? Not a whole lot, but we're at a point now where we're doing things that are actually genuinely interesting. And I think that's what's bringing them in. But this other idea of an impending broad scale collapse of the whole everything around us. You know, it occurs to me, look, this is this has got to be the other part of it. I'm sure there's many of you out there saying, yeah, like no shit, Dolan. So tell me something I don't know. But I'm saying this here because uh, it doesn't really seem to be part of our conversation in the UFO community much anymore. I think if you go back to the 1950s, early 1960s, yes. I think yes. Uh, there was there was a much higher um, notion of a really true impending 
danger and threat to humanity as a whole through the threat of nuclear war. This was very much a, a you know a powerful idea that captured the imagination of so many people because it was so new. Atomic weapons were clearly orders of magnitude beyond anything we'd ever had. And then the Russians get them and it's like, oh my God, we're facing off with each other here. This could really get bad and we could just destroy each other. And uh, so I think that was a very significant part of our thinking. But somehow I, I just think, I don't really think that in the UFO community, there's much of a recognition that, or at least it's not at the top of our thinking. And it seems to me we often forget this. We actually could just do a massive screwing of the whole global system here. I mean, it's already kind of happening. And the question is, how bad is it going to get? And I'm not, not just, you know, people like to argue about climate change. God, if I talk about that, I'll probably get dinged by YouTube. But there's all these other things that are there to talk about. You know, just the fact that we're throwing plastics into the environment and you got Japan about to dump how many tons of uh, radioactive waste into, you know, from Fukushima into the Pacific. And the let's not forget the wonderful Pacific garbage patch, which the last time I heard is the size of the nation of Spain, I think. It's massive. And everything else, you know, from 1945 till the end of the century, we had over 2,000 detonations of nuclear weapons. Good grief. Do we don't think that's going to have an effect on everything around us? Has to. Has to. And the fact is, like, we just are completely unaware. And then all of the combinations of toxins and chemicals and everyone's ingesting, it's like, good grief. Okay. We don't know what we're doing to ourselves. We don't know what we're doing to the rest of the world. We can't keep up. Our science can't keep up. Something bad, I think, is likely to happen as a result of this. And I'm not saying it's extinction, but I'm also saying that is possible. It was like no species lasts forever anyway. And we're in a very unstable situation. That is not difficult to understand, right? Right. Okay. So I think this possibility, whether it's through environmental screwing the pooch of the world or, uh, you know, nuclear exchange, because that's actually still a possibility. You've got Eastern Europe, like anything can happen there. You've got the South China Sea, that's a real flashpoint. Boy, that's a real possible flashpoint. You've got uh, India and Pakistan. You've got India and China. You've got the entire Middle East. Like, you know, we're, we're begging for an escalation of something to happen. And who knows what is, what is the outcome here? So, and, you know, let's just talk about nukes a little bit. Um. Do all of those nuclear detonations that we did have an effect on them in some way, in some next door dimension, right? I mean, we know for a fact that UFO activity has one important area of UFO activity has been nuclear technology and nuclear weapons sites. We know this. I don't think that's an accident. I don't think anyone thinks that's an accident. So are we doing something to them <laughs> intrinsically that we are not yet able to understand? Mm. Or are they just intrinsically concerned about a potential nuclear exchange here because after all, Earth might be valuable to them for all kinds of reasons and they don't wanna see that happen either. So there's a number of things happening here. It seems to me, you know, we are as a species, we're at, we're at an existential moment. I know I used that word before, but I'm using it again here. We're at an existential moment in which we're at this, it's the fork in the road. And we're either going to go down one road or another. One road is some kind of, like to our vision, probably insane future of what the human species is going to become. It's not a vision that I am especially enamored with, by the way. Like I don't, I don't relish the idea of humanity becoming a, you know, one big giant anthill where everyone is just corralled and there's no jobs because Terminators come to take your job away and you're living on UBI and like there's really nothing for you to do. Like that world doesn't excite me. And, you know, maybe though people will find things that they can do. All right. But like 
what are they going to find to do that's actually meaningful? I, I don't know. Maybe they'll figure something out. Maybe our great grandchildren will look back on. They'll they'll find this little talk of mine. They'll be like, "Geez, that guy is like had no clue." Could be. Totally could be. But anyway, so that's one potential future. The other, you know, it would be a future that would certainly involve very, very advanced artificial intelligence, very, very advanced weapons. Like, can't forget that. Very advanced use of energy, like high level stuff that we are doing now. Total mastery of the genome and CRISPR technology that's like next, beyond next generation. So we, we, don't, we don't even think we have the ability, truthfully, to envision that world, but we try, I try. So that's one road. The other road is we completely screw things over and like destroy a huge portion of everything around us. That is a possibility. And I think we're, we would be foolish if we pretend that that is not. So that I think if you really want a reason why there's another species or other multiple species probably that's here checking us out, investigating us and interacting and probably getting their fingers into the society, because I do think that's what's happening on a variety of levels, it seems to be the case. It's probably not hard to see why. This is not something aliens, in my view anyway, would have been as likely to do a hundred years ago, or let's play it safe, 200, 300 years ago. There would have not been as much in it for them, but now there is. Now there's, the stakes are much higher. So I don't think it's difficult to see why a species from elsewhere would be interested in manipulating and let us say even maybe managing human society and human civilization. There's another thing I want to think about. <clears throat> um, I haven't read this book yet, but I've heard of it and I, I've learned a little bit about it, a book called The Fourth Turning. And I'm going to guess some of you are familiar with this book. And it does strike me as something that's interesting. So I'll give you my very uh, low level understanding of it and and uh, and then try to explain why I think it's it's relevant in this conversation here. So The Fourth Turning was a book, I think it was written over 10 years ago. And it's essentially puts forth that I, by the way, I was interested in this because I thought this is this the fourth stage of humanity? Is this the same thing I was talking about? Turns out it isn't. Okay. But it's interesting on its own merits. So the author of this posits that essentially, I think they, they're he or they are talking about American history primarily, not necessarily world history, if I'm getting this right. And that there are these 80 year cycles that are identified. And within each cycle, there are essentially four 20 year periods. Uh, they call them turnings. You can call them generations. Uh, I have I have mixed feelings about these types of theories that see a cyclical pattern to human society, but I, I'm gonna acknowledge that there, there can be merit to some of these analyses. And in this particular case, I thought it was interesting enough that I'm gonna mention here. So in that theory, the last 80 year cycle ended with the Great Depression and the Second World War. And that cycle is the crisis slash catastrophe and after which you get a new cycle. So they go through different phases and the, the first cycle is like, everything's great. We're you know pioneers, visionaries, and then you've got another cycle and you get another cycle and you get the catastrophe. So we're, we're in the catastrophe cycle as well, just in case you wanna know. But the Second World War was the last catastrophe cycle. And when you really brought, talk about UFOs here, if you really want to go there, that, of course, was when we experienced a large amount of UFO sightings for the first time that we actually were noticing them on a large scale. The Foo Fighters appeared during that time frame, right? Now, it doesn't mean that there were no... UFOs before, there were. There are quite a few very good documented sightings prior to that, but there were certainly many that appeared during the Second World War. So uh, it makes me wonder. So now, now you know, you fast forward 80 years and here we are. 
we're in another crisis and we're in the COVID crisis. Now, COVID's not the same as the Second World War. We don't have the massive amount of killing and bloodshed. And But I mean, realistically, I don't think it's a stretch at all to say that COVID is doing to our world in, in many critical ways what World War II did to the world back then. That is, it is remaking the world in a totally new image. And that is our crisis, and we all see it happening. Um, now, I mean, you know, what does that really mean? Well, one, one of the things that it, it seems to me is that we can assume right now that an alien species, one or m multiple, would be well aware of the dangers and of the significance of, of human beings at this particular time. And I think we can assume, yeah, I wanna segue into something different here. I think we can assume that although there is probably a great deal of life in this universe, I think we're, most scientists have now come to like, yeah, okay, there's probably a lot of life in the universe. There are scientists who still deny it. There are scientists who still think we're alone. But I think there's a lot of scientists who believe, now there's probably a great deal of life. But then you have to ask how much of it has reached the stage of advanced technological proficient science. No one knows, of course. I don't know. You don't know. But I think you know, most people who've looked into this carefully or deeply, who've thought about it, um, I think for the most part have concluded there may not be a high percentage of that that advanced technological life that has mastered science, that can master interstellar travel, that may not happen very often. Now, there's enough out there that in sheer numbers, there could very well be quite a few advanced technological scientific civilizations. I personally think probably yes. But here's what I wanna say, you know, the percentage is probably low that it reaches such a high stage. And that leads to this thought here. Think about this. In economics, successful corporations can often become monopolies. You know, think of Amazon or think of Standard Oil with John D. Rockefeller or any number of other very successful organizations that are able to gain a dominant advantage over their competitors and, and then learn to game the system in all different ways, politically and through shady deals and what have you, whatever, whatever they do. They're able to create essentially a monopolistic uh, situation for themselves in which they can then overwhelm their competitors and crowd them out and dominate the field. Like that happens. And in fact, it's not simply economics. I was just talking about human beings dominating all life forms on planet Earth. We're doing it here. That's what we have done. So here's what I wanna ask you. What is to say there is not such a pattern beyond this planet of ours? Like what is to say that there is not some other apex predator or dominant species in our local galactic neighborhood, our local group or our, our whole galaxy? What if there's a dominant apex predator in the galaxy or even beyond the galaxy? It doesn't seem to be impossible to me. And so once a particular species uh, becomes dominant or doesn't even have to be a species, it could be an algorithm, it could be an artificially intelligent algorithm that becomes a dominant factor in a region dominant over all other methods of organization, intellectual, social, biological, whatever, may not make a difference. Could that be the case? And are we, <laughs> are we entering that world? Are we dealing with such an apex predator? You know, the other reason I think that we're important to someone right now, and this is something no one talks about. I think I'm the only person in the UFO field who even occasionally brings this up. The fact that on any given day of the year around the world, there are innumerable sightings of dramatic objects reported by ordinary people every single day, thousands every year that, that we know about. 
thousands that we know about, how many that we don't even know about, uh, many of which involve dead of night experiences at like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. All right, something is going on of, you know, dark triangles or dark uh, disc-shaped objects, saucers hovering over your neighborhood because they're everyone's neighborhood. What are these things? They're practically every night. You go onto the National UFO Reporting Center, you go to the MUFON CMS database if you're able to get access to it, which I'm not, but I can get to the New Fork site and, and you know, there's other sources out there. This is widespread. And, you know, look, whoever is behind this phenomenon, like this is a substantial undertaking. I, I don't know why people don't talk about this. Is it that they think, ah, sightings, who cares? We've been there, lights in the sky, don't need to d deal with that anymore. Let's get with the interesting stuff. Let me tell you something, that is some of the interesting stuff because it's so massive. There is a substantial infrastructure behind whoever's doing that. There are substantial resources behind whoever is behind all those black triangles and all of those saucer shaped objects that are hovering over your neighborhood at three in the morning. Someone considers that very important. Someone considers that a mission because that's what it is. Someone is spending the equivalent of a lot of money, whatever, whatever they use as a medium of exchange in their society, if they have such a thing, it's important because it's going on every single day, every single night. And most of it is covert. Most of it is incredibly covert. But when people see it, it's, it's like it's by accident frequently. Sometimes it's during the daytime, that's true. But when it happens during the daytime, it's very frequently like, wow, did you just see that? It's very quick, very ephemeral. It's happening all around us. And I don't really hear a lot of researchers really talking about that. I mean, look, in fairness, there's a lot of other interesting things to talk about with the UFO subject. I get it. Okay. But look, this remains important. Resources, energy, money, secrecy. And by the way, I seriously doubt we will be getting these types of questions asked in the forthcoming report by the UAP task force which by the way is now being examined, uh, we are told by the Inspector General's office out of the Pentagon. That's a new article that just came out. And uh, that is quite interesting indeed, whether that's going to be more than a, you know, going through the motions exercise by the IG or whether it will actually be something that is meaningful, your guess is as good as mine, I have no idea. You know, 30 years ago, roughly speaking, uh, the General Accounting Office of, of Congress was charged with conducting an investigation of Roswell. Some of you know this, some of you may not know this. Early 1990s, when Roswell was becoming a big thing. It was only in the 80s and 90s where Roswell was becoming something that people were talking about. And by the early 90s, New Mexico representative of Congress, Stephen Schiff said, you know what, I will look into this because he was asked by some uh, constituents. And he got complete pushback from the Air Force, which literally at one point, one of the Air Force liaisons said to Schiff, go shit in your hat. Yes, they were not particularly com uh, you know, cooperative with Stephen Schiff, to put it mildly. But Schiff then got a, a group that represents Congress, the GAO, the General Accounting Office. Normally they wouldn't do this kind of investigation, but they said, you know what, we will. They got no cooperation, zero from the Air Force. And, you know, the records that they were looking for went missing. They talked about it after, the, you know, eventually they said, look, we were not really able to get any significant cooperation. So that was 30 years ago, almost. Now we're in today. How different is this world today? We have a situation where it's very obvious you've got intense, a lifetime of intense secrecy on the UFO subject. It's obvious that crash retrievals have been going on for 70 plus years. Obvious that it's been going on for 70 plus years. I'm not gonna go over all the evidence here. I've got some of that for my uh, May 20th lecture. And I've talked about it here on YouTube many times anyway. There's very compelling case to be made for that. 
So someone knows, and whether the UAP task force is going to actually have access to knowing, I just somehow think they won't. And the real question is, will they have access to the deeply privatized, beyond classified places like in Lockheed or Boeing or McDonnell Douglas or Raytheon or General Electric or any of these other defense contractors that have their own slice of the secret because they do. Well, I think we can be pretty certain that there will be no access to any of those. You know, the quote that I read you by Harry Reid earlier, that I think says it all. The corporations are off limits. We have a system of legal illegality that is in place. Now, that doesn't mean nothing can happen. It doesn't mean that the task force may not have a bombshell or two. Like, I would like to see that. You would like to see that, I think. And, and it's, it is possible, in fact, that some of these more serious existential elements of the UFO phenomenon that I've just been touching on here, you know, matters of genuine life and death, matters of human survival or moving to the next stage of whatever thing we're supposed to become, and the fact that they're just here engaging with us on a daily basis secretly, like these are important issues. And, and what is the likelihood that the UAP task force is going to raise these issues? I think it's low likelihood, but it's not impossible. One of the people that uh, I think has been consulting with him is Dr. Eric Davis himself. And, you know, the thing about Eric Davis, uh, he, you know, he's been very upfront about a lot of these issues. Eric Davis has come right to the edge of talking openly about crash retrievals of UFOs in the public realm. Kind of amazing. And we know that he's talked with a lot of these folks. And, you know, he was at the Skinwalker Ranch back in the 90s. He's got a very good understanding, I think, of this phenomenon. And he strikes me as someone who's quite willing to be candid about it, especially with the right group. So it's possible that these issues have been raised behind closed doors. Whether they're going to be raised in, in the non-classified version of that report, well, uh, I'm thinking the answer is no. I'm thinking the answer is no. But the thing is, like, there's something truly monumental about this subject of UFOs that we, we generally just don't discuss a lot of these issues because maybe they're just too unsettling for the most part. And, you know, I understand that. Uh, this is an unsettling subject and we don't really, you know, we don't know where we're going to be down the road here. We are at a crossroads in our, in our society, in our existence as a species. That's just the reality of it. And where we're going to be in another 50, 100 years is nearly impossible to tell. I don't think any of us knows, but I will say that, you know, the fact that they are here in force now is not an accident. There's something very critically important about this. And, you know, we want to stay at this, I think, anyway, I think we're wise if we keep the conversation at a fundamental level. It's very easy to get uh, trapped in these little interesting but but nevertheless peripheral kinds of conversations frequently. Whether we're talking about, you know, will we be able to end UFO secrecy? Like that's just the beginning of this subject. And because where the rubber meets the pavement it seems to me is our interaction with these other beings, whoever they are, whatever they are, and what they are intending to do here. You know, there's there's one there's a couple of ways you can look at their motivations, and I'm I'm probably going to wrap this up soon. I actually wasn't expecting to go for as long as an hour. I thought I'd be in and out in a half hour with this, and here I am, it's 54 minutes. But um, you can look at their presence as a positive, or you can look at it as a negative. So the positive way you can look at it is you can say, well, they've come here. They see that we're about to just destroy ourselves and they want us not to destroy ourselves. So they're going to take control 
uh, or they're going to work through the global elites. You know, the guys over at Davos, CFR, the Bilderberg meetings, Bohemian Grove, and they say, look, we're going to create a new world order through this COVID pandemic. But basically, we're going to just save humanity from themselves because they're too stupid and they can't really save themselves because they're going to destroy everything. Now, I don't, I don't know. Uh, that actually may be their motivation, but I'm not sure that's a good motivation. I do think that our human elite handlers, th I think this is what they believe. I think this is actually their belief. And I, I think furthermore that they are imbued with the exact same vision of progress that existed in like those futuristic, you know, uh, little films of, the, of like 1960. You know, remember this? The future will be just perfect. A uh, future in which science and technology create this utopia that solve all of our problems, right? I mean, there, go go find some of these. It's called retrofuturism. There's some amazing videos on YouTube that describe this, and it's it's kind of a crazy mindset when you really get into it and you see what people of that era. I mean, I was born into that era. Many of you were born into that era. This idea that the future will be like the Jetsons cartoon, like literally like that, you know, the little bubble soft, bubble car flying saucer and everyone's happy and we've solved all the problems. And, uh, you know, you, you go in a high speed car on an empty highway to the nearest city where there's all of these really crazy Dr. Seuss looking roads that, uh, and like these people back then thought that this was like an awesome future. Like that's the crazy thing totally disconnected from the natural environment, totally disconnected from your biological sense of who you are as a human being. But they thought, yeah, they we're gonna create this techno utopia, this science utopia. Like there's never been a point in human history where any society ever thought such a thing until after World War, well, really the 20th century. You can get it even in the 19 teens and 20s and 30s, but it really gets going in the 50s and 60s, right? And then of course it comes crashing down. But I believe that the masters of our little global world here, the Davos people, let's call them, I think this is what they think. I think that they believe they're going to create, they're going to micromanage a technological utopia. You know, for them, they'll, they'll love it. You won't love it, probably, and I know I'm not going to love it, but so I think that's their vision. And I, and I, I mean, there could be people in there who are like genuinely like, you know, twirling the mustache, blah, ha, ha, thinking we're going to destroy humanity. I don't think that people think that way normally. I think they just rationalize things very, very well for themselves. And I believe that they probably convinced themselves, you know, that this is what we need. So whoever was behind creating like the Georgia Guidestones and that type of mentality, I think that's, they, I think they believe this. And they believe that we're just, we are, uh, an infantile, you know, mentality in our species, and we don't know how to manage ourselves, and all we'll do is just me mess everything up. And I mean, maybe that, look, let's have an honest conversation here. Is that a possibility? Well, I don't know, but I don't want to think that. I believe in human freedom. I believe in your freedom. I believe in my freedom. But I also think we have been hampered in our ability to make this world a genuinely better and safer place. So it goes the other way. Like we have been hampered in our ability to develop genuinely good energy solutions. Many times, but a lot of people, they die mysterious deaths or the energy patents don't somehow materialize and they disappear. And we're still stuck with the same paradigm that we've had since forever. So there's that part of it. We're being held back. I do, I do believe that if we as a species were unleashed in the proper way with true intelligence and a true understanding of our mission as a species, that we, we just might be able to have the best of all of these worlds, which is freedom and a safe future. I think it's possible. I don't know it's definite, but that's the future I would like to shoot for. That's not the future that we seem to have laid out for us. That's for that's for sure. So that's, you know, that's one way to look at the aliens, that they're like, we're going to work with this human elite and we're just going to manage the, the masses because we can't trust them to do anything. And there are people who think of that as a good thing and there are people who think of that as a bad thing. Like, that's the crazy thing. 
of our world. But I do think whoever is behind like the global, I'll say pandemic, pan pandemic that we're dealing with, all right, because obviously what we can see, look, however you want to see the origin of, of COVID, look, the reality is the reaction to this is creating a completely dystopian, crazy world. It just is. It just is. And that could be by design. That could be by default. Either way, it's happening. And there are people all at the top of our little pyramid who are all too happy to jump on top of that opportunity and make a whole lot of things happen that would never, ever have been possible for them in terms of social control, in terms of technological control and surveillance and everything else. So that's all happened. It's happened. It's not even happening. So, yeah, we have a lot to think about here. And are these problems that even have solutions at this point? I like to think that they do. I like to think that we have the ability even now, even at this late stage, to gain actual truth and information and knowledge about the true situation of what is happening to us. And that must include an understanding of who these other beings are and what they're doing. And even if we can't, with this new UAP task force report, get an idea of like who these other guys are, these other beings, we have the ability now us, private researchers, and those people in the task force to analyze those reports sufficiently to have a pretty damn good idea about what is going on. And I'll guarantee you, within that world, within that classified world, there are people who absolutely have a crystal clear idea of what's going on. The real question is, does the task force, do they, are they going to have it any easier than Harry Reid when he tried just to get access to Lockheed, just like one company. And they slam that door right in his face. Is the task force going to be any more effective? Well, I'm not going to hold my breath expecting that they will be, but we'll see. I'll, I'll say this, then I'm going to wrap it up here. We've got a long, we, <laughs> I used to say for years, like disclosure is not the end of the fight for truth is really the beginning of the next stage in the fight for truth. And that I think is remains true. Like it's the next stage. So whatever information we get, we have to assume, we have to know, look, this is not the final end. This is not the end of the road here. We've got much, much more that we're gonna have to fight for in terms of getting information. And and the UFO subject isn't just some like theoretical, oh, I wonder if there's something out there kind of a game, like a little you know intellectual game that people play. No, it's much more serious than that. It's much more profound and of deep lasting significance. And I think, look, the time is long past where we just are playing these little games here and pretending that we don't know what they are and we don't... Uh, you know, maybe they're here and maybe they're not here. We're, we're getting it now and we know it's real. They are here and they are important and we need to, we need to understand what they are about because we're at our own fork in the road. And I'm not sure I love either fork, by the way, but we're at a fork and we're going to go one direction or another. So I would like it to be a direction of survival. And I would like it to be a direction that includes as much as much freedom and human dignity as we can as we can manage and fight for and obtain. And I do think that we can do a lot. So again, I just want to remind all of you, if you're interested in this type of conversation, I'm going to be going into this way more deeply in three weeks on May 20th, less than three weeks, for UFO Secrecy in a Changing World. I'm, I'm doing two lectures. I've got Lou Elizondo. I'll be doing Q&A personally of him and he'll be answering your questions and an entire panel of the young guns and they will be, all of us will be available for many, many hours after that whole thing is over in a virtual environment where we'll be able to talk with you and answer your questions after the whole thing is done, just like at an actual in-person conference. Where else are you gonna find that these days? Like th that world has almost been destroyed by the COVID uh, lockdowns we're trying to do what we can to recreate some kind of 
uh, social interaction among people in this community because we desperately need it. We're doing it here a little bit on YouTube, but we can actually do it by voice on this event. So go check it out. I got a link below. And uh, oh, and I'll be doing a Friday event at that observatory, it's called the observation deck, where this conference is being held virtually. I will be there this Friday, at nine o'clock. Uh, if you've signed up for it, you can go hang out with me. We'll have we'll have some conversation. Well, that's all I got for you tonight. I hope uh, this has been interesting for you. I want to thank all of you in the chat room for your support. It means a lot to me. Honestly, it truly does. And it would be hard for anyone to do this without knowing that there's at least some people out there who are uh, into what you've got to say. And I, I'm grateful for that to you. Uh, thank you for your positive comments. Thank you for the super chat. I see there's one there. And... Uh, Let's keep our chin up and let's keep fighting the good fight. Catch you all next time real soon. Bye for now.